Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, welcome to this NPTEL massive online open course, Phonetics and Phonology, a broad overview. We have been talking about phonology, but we talked about uh, phonemes, uh, phonemics, features, and also about rules and how we formalize rules. And in this class also, we will continue in this lecture talking about phonological processes and alternations. So what are alternations? Though? So the focus of phonology is to find predictable alternations between sounds and as we saw in the last couple of lectures that in uh, phonology we assume that there is an underlying form, there is a representation and we have uh, rules and as a result we get our surface representation and we have seen this in our previous uh, lecture also that the application of rules give us this surface representation. So um, the alternation and then this surface representation is determined by the environment in which the phoneme occurs. This alternation occurs due to or because of some phonological processes and there are very many phonological processes in various languages and they have been analyzed uh, in great detail and what are those? Those are called processes of assimilation, harmony, metathesis, pa palatalization, labialization and um, consonant harmony, vowel and uh, voicing assimilation and other processes. Uh, we can represent processes which characterize alternations by means of rules. Rules are formal statements which express the relationship between units on the different levels of the phonological component. And now uh, what we saw just now that these rules, these rules are basically formal statements of a process happening in a natural language. So the rules are formal statements which express the relationship between units on the different levels of the phonological component. And these alternations are nothing but processes which are a part of a native speaker's knowledge of the language and which are then expressed, formalized in terms of rules. And these rules show nothing else but the alternations. And so to at the risk of repeating the thing, we um, have to keep this in mind that formalizing rules is nothing but expressing the, the fact that this knowledge is there in the native speaker's knowledge of the language and the phonology tries to capture the, the mental organization, the representation of that knowledge through these formal devices. The aim of generative phonology is to give formal representation of such knowledge. And suppose we talk about um, English plural, the English plurals are classic examples of phonological alternations. So, the is. And um, so we have these alternations like cats, dogs uh, and horses. An alternation in uh, voicing for uh, the root final uh, fricative, for instance, thief versus thieves or house versus houses. And uh, then we have electric, electricity or medical versus medicine. And so the ones that you see in red, there is something happening there. So we can see a change 
this is the change is called the alternation. Now, why is this happening in English that repeatedly we see things which involve a voicing a property. Now, just for the sake of uh, bringing in something that when we looked at articulation, uh, this is our voicing. So, this is our voicing, our vocal fold voicing, which happens as a result of the vocal fold vibration. Now, we are looking at the phonology, but we have to bear in mind that these are the different levels, linguistic levels that we are talking about and there is some relation of one with the other. And this is a voicing that we are talking about, this is a voicing that we had seen uh, when we had talked about articulatory phonetics. Okay, now this voicing is a process in English and in process which shows up in the morphology. So, why are we saying morphology? Because remember that this is now a English plural that we are talking about, we are not talking about uh, simple words without any morphological, uh, any uh, more morphological component, we are not talking about simple words uh, without any morphological complexity, we are not talking about just cat, we are talking about what happens when we add the plural morpheme to it, we are talking about what happens to dog when you happen the plural morpheme to it, it changes, it changes its voicing property. Similarly, if we have thief versus thieves, house versus houses and then we have some others like um, this is not as you can see this is not the curve to search change is not a voicing change it is a change from stop to fricative. So, this is happening in the presence uh, when the morphemes are there in the word. Alternations are therefore uh, of various types and alternations can occur in the phonetic environment and we saw that when we saw the English flapping roll, we saw that with English aspiration. There we did not um, invoke anything with regard to the morphology, but here uh, the morphology is uh, important because it is the plural morpheme which is behaving in a certain way. So, uh, Alternations um, occur, may occur when the phonetic environment is met, but they may be also may be sometimes found only in the presence of a particular morpheme and they can also be restricted to some specific lexical items. So, uh, morphemes can be the target of phonological alternations. Also, it may be just a phonetic context regardless of whether there is a morphemic content to it or not. Also, sometimes it can be specific lexical items as we just saw with the example of electricity or medicine. So, now phonological alternation, sometimes we can have addition of morphemes, but still the phonetic environment may be just there. So, this data is from Choctaw, the it is from again Hayes 2009 introductory phonology. And something is happening here, you can see the a symbol for the R uh, vowel which is represented with these two dots and those dots are used to show length in linguistics. Now, we can see the original word pisa, but then we see that, in, that it is lengthened in various places, it is pisa, pisali or pisachi or, or chi pisa or chi pisa li or chi pisa chi or pisa chi pisa chi li pisa chi li or uh, chi pisa chi li. Okay, so not all R's are lengthened. So, this R here is not lengthened. Only this R is lengthened. This R is lengthened. This R. Now, we see a repetition of something, it is not the vowel R which is being the target of lengthening, the, the, the target of lengthening is something else. So, this is called rhythmic lengthening. So, the pattern here is that the second syllable is lengthened. So, whenever we have a second syllable or whenever we have a fourth syllable, and so, this 1, 2, 3, 4, so the fourth syllable or the second syllable is lengthened. So, what is happening here? Even numbered syllables are long. 
and unless they are in the final syllable. So, unless they are in the final syllable, why is it necessary? Because in words like chipi, sali, this, this li is not long. So, initial and final um, syllables are not lengthened, final syllables even if they are the fourth syllable they are not lengthened, they must be between um, two syllables. So, that is why the second and fourth. So, this is now one type of phonological um, lengthening. Even if we have more data, we see this happening. So, this is second um, vowel lengthen here, second vowel and second and fourth vowel, second and fourth, second, fourth. So, if we have a very long word, then we have second and fourth as well. The final one is not lengthened even if it is an even numbered syllable. So, now we have uh, this very extensive morphology here in Choctaw, but we see that this rule that a vowel becomes plus long in the environment where it is um, between one consonant and one vowel is repeatedly iteratively applied left to right, but this is not applicable if this V C C V is in the final uh, syllable, okay, and this is, this is only applicable to even numbered syllables counting from the beginning of the word. Now this is a phonological alternation, and this happens irrespective of the the t the, the the morpheme. So it's not dictated; it's not determined by the property of the morphemes. Um, which are being added to the word. So, the phonology is the phonology of the word, the phonetic context is given by the addition of the morphology, but the morphology per se is not determining this alternation. So, um, going back to the English examples that we have, uh, the form of the plural depends on the nature of the last sound. So, if the noun ends in sibilants like sirza, sherja, charja, it takes is. So, these are called sibilants and whenever there is a sibilant in English, so whenever you have a word like horse or course etcetera, uh, then we have uh, we, it takes is uh, horses, courses etcetera and however, uh, this so this rule is applicable of the, the, the rule of adding is in plural forms is applicable when it ends in a uh, the word ends in a sibilant. Otherwise, it is a voiceless non sibilant, it takes the voiceless alveolar fricative sa. So, if the final sound is a voice non sibilant, it takes a voice fricative za. So, um, now note that again coming back to morphologically conditioned alternation. So, this alternation is different from the Choctaw alternation that we have just seen because the Choctaw alternation does not is not conditioned by the morphology. Uh, so, the phonetic environment alone is not the most important requirement. So, we can take examples like dance or lens, these are counter examples which do not require. So, we do not have the uh, sir changing to z because of preceding na. So, no that did not happen. Uh, the final fricative agrees in voice with the preceding sound only if it is the plural that is only in the context of these morphemes. Other examples include the past tense markers the, the, id in English. So, we have um, the, the, so uh, the, the past tense marker and um, for instance, pat, uh, patted and uh, if we have a voiceless preceding the, a voiceless consonant preceding the past tense, then it is the or if it is another alveolar, then we have id if it is a voice consonant, we have the. So, uh, fricatives are voiced between voiced segments. So, we have leaf leaves and the velar k is fronted fricativized and we have velar softening which is uh, this is the process of change from a soft from a um, from a stop to a fricative is called softening.
and also some morphological conditioning for example there are others like um, trisyllabic lengthening um, in English. So, and also the other um, non-phonological alternations which does not involve phonology for instance go went uh, where there is no relationship uh, we cannot see any phonological uh, process happening when go becomes went or when good becomes better or worse. So, rule writing as we know uh, or as we saw in the last uh, lecture the rule of uh, velarization in English. So, if we have lateral becomes velarized if there is a following consonant or if it is the word final position and other types. So, and now we have just looked at how phonological rules interact with morphology and morphology can and uh, modify the environment where the sound occurs by adding more phonological morphological substance. So, we have pre glottalization it can become a continuant a minus continuant become and minus voice can become constricted glottis um, in the word final position and more uh, familiar with us is the tapping rule which we saw in one of the last lectures in English. So, uh, this tapping rule is that ter becomes the tap when it is uh, between uh, vowels where one is minus stress and where is one is stressless and, and the aspiration rule that we know this S G stands for spread glottis. So, minus continuum minus voice becomes spread glottis when in the situation where it is uh, in a initial stress position or it is in a uh, syllable initial position. So, there are again other types of rules feature changing rules rules which affect individual features or small groups of features like nasal assimilation flapping glottalization or there are also rules of dissimulation uh, where two adjacent segments which share some features become different from each other or change a feature so that they become different from each other and that is called dissimulation and more common are deletion rules when something is deleted we use this symbol to express this. So, if in the word final position if in the word final position something is deleted then we would use a rule like this that a goes to null in the context where it is in the word final position following b. In some varieties of English the word final coronal stop is deleted and this is a post nasal deletion is seen here in hand or in lists and also there are processes of insertion which involves inserting a segment that was not originally there. Uh, in some varieties of English liquid nasal clusters film becomes film uh, which is very common in Indian English. There is metathesis is another process metathesis refers to the reversal of a sequence of segments in a word. And then we have uh, so metathesis examples would be um, if I can think of So, this is an example of uh, metathesis where we have Benares in, uh, in English where the na is uh, changes its position with the ra and whereas the ra uh, the this syllable. So, this the second syllable and the third syllable uh, have changed their uh, word initial onset switch their word initial onset from Benares to Varanasi. So, this is a typical example of metathesis. So, um, we have reduplication as uh, one of the phonological actually it is morphophonological reduplication is a mm, huge topic which involves studying how um, part of a word or um, parts or vowels or consonants are repeated is it's a copying of a part of the word and attaching the copy to the original word. And usually the initial consonant is copied along with the vowel, but there are many many different ways in which reduplication can happen in languages and Indian languages have a lot of reduplication or uh, languages uh, spoken in India have a lot of reduplication which can be studied in great detail. Now, we can uh, look at a bit more of how uh, rules are expressed and let us see the Russian voicing assimilation rule and 
why is this rule uh, expressed like this? So, look at the data here. So, uh, the data is again from um, Hayes 2009 introductory phonology. So, our underlying form is uh, from mm, is ot ot mami here it is from mama pod is a locative preposition which is pod uh, mamo under mama. So, uh, this is showing from and this showing under and if we have uh, two words here we if we say from grandma or we say under papa then uh, what happens to ot and pod. So, ought can change from ta to the. Why, why did this alternation happen? And pod uh, has this alternation of the to ta. Why? Now, why do we have this reverse um, alternation in the two words here? Because um, as is obvious that here of course, we have two different words here we have a nasal otmami and podmamoi here we have we do not have a nasal in babushki which means grandma we have an obstruent similarly we have an obstruent and in the presence of obstruent then the and the can change their underlying form so the can become the and the can become ta. So, the, the can become reverse of each other and depending on what the following consonant is and the following consonant may change from a nasal to a voiced obstruent and then ta will change to the, the voiced counterpart and the will alternate with ta, the voiceless counterpart, counterpart if there is a following voiceless obstruent. So, here we have a voiceless obstruent and so we have ta, here we have a voiced obstruent. So, we have the. So, there is alternation from ta to the and the to ta, uh, the to ta, yes. So, how do we express this? So, an obstruent takes uh, on the voicing of a following obstruent and why are we expressing this with the with this notation of alpha? Because um, we are trying to capture the generalize capture the change the alternation that the minus sonorant will either become plus voice if the minus sonorant is plus voice or the minus sonorant will become minus voice in the context where the sonorant minus sonorant is minus voice. Basically, these two have to match. So, it has to the, the alternation the result of the alternation has to match with the voicing feature of the following minus sonorant. So, if it was underlyingly minus voice it will become plus voice if it was underlyingly plus voice it will become minus voice and that is captured with this with the use of the alpha voice which means alpha if this is minus this is also minus, if this is plus, this is also plus. So, sometimes this can be expressed with, with an i, so index and um, showing that whatever value of the voice is, if it is plus, this will be plus, if it is minus, this will be minus. We also look at a bit of English phonotactics. Uh, English uh, phonotactics is with regard to uh, nasal uh, nasal obstruent clusters. So, these are all nasal obstruent clusters in English N C 
clamp blunt honk okay so and we can take more words if we can think about them so if we have so let's t think about plant or camp or uh, scent or lamp or tank. Uh, what we see here is uh, a repetition uh, of the place of articulation of the following consonant in the nasal that we see there. And so, if this is T, this is also N, if this is P, this is also M, they are both labial, they are both alveolar, if this is velar, this is also velar. So, what do we see here in English phonotactics? In English phonotactics, now we have an example which shows that a nasal in an NC nasal um, obstruent cluster, if a following consonant is, if a following obstruent is labial, then the preceding nasal is also labial. If following consonant is alveolar, then the nasal is also alveolar. If the following consonant is velar, then the nasal is also velar. So, in English phonotactics 10, um, nasal shares the place of articulation of the following obstruent. So, like the Russian example that we just saw, we then have to express this by showing that the nasal and the following obstruent share the place of articulation. Okay. So, in an NC nasal obstruent cluster in English becomes the nasal obstruent cluster in English, the nasal obstruent shares the place of articulation of the following obstruent. So, we can either index it and show that the Yes, so we can just show that this place of articulation of the obstruent is the place of obstruent of this uh, the, of the nasal which is of the nasal which is preceding the the obstruent. So, so the nasal and obstruent showing that the nasal and obstruent share the place of articulation there and that place of articulation is the place of articulation following obstruent. Now, although we have to remember that this is a bit simplistic generalization of the uh, of English phonotactics because we may have other examples where for instance like examples like invade etcetera or uh, even other examples like infallible or etcetera. So, uh, what happens in those words is that this nasal and this obstruent they do not share the place of articulation and then we may have to express that ex part of the data as saying that whenever the, there is no corresponding place of articulation for the nasal, the nasal is alveolar. So, th this is just to show that if there are phonotactic rules in languages which can be expressed like this. And so, now in the end of this lecture, now we have seen that languages have various rules and languages have phonetic um, rules which are determined by the phonetic context and they are always automatic, always apply in any. Uh, so, just if the context is given, the rule applies. So, uh, that that happens automatically and then there is the sometimes which are rules are governed by the morphology, they are morphologically conditioned rules Then we have seen how that happens in English. Uh, so, English plural formation or English past tense formation, we have seen that those rule the voicing assimilation there is a is determined by uh, morphology. And then we have lexically conditioned rules and then we have also phonotactics which we saw in the last uh, lecture uh, where we talked about um, the uh, where we talk extensively about phonotactics about um, rules versus con. Uh, constraints and also we talked about the psychological reality of the phoneme and in that lecture we saw that uh, how phonotactics is an integral part of the uh, phonology uh, of a language and uh, right now we saw how 
um, rule can be applied to the phonotactics. And also in this lecture, we saw how rules are applicable in context of deletion or in the context of voicing assimilation or in the context of place assimilation, etc. And how we can express those rules in the format of uh, what we have seen x goes to y in the environment z. In the next lecture, we will look at um, rules again. We will look at ordered rules and we will look at morphophonology and then um, we come to the end of this overview on phonology. But till then, we have more to talk about in phonology and after that, we also have to talk about syllables. We have talked about features today and we will see how um, sonority plays a role in syllabification and we also have to talk about tone and intonation. Thank you for your attention and I will see you in the next lecture.